You are at a museum. A data pad belonging to the museum hovers just beside you. An automated tour program loads on the screen. Greetings, citizens of the Galactic Union, and welcome to the Museum of Humanity and Astronautical Innovations. I am your narrator and digital host, September Vigilant. In anticipation of your questions, yes, I am an artificial sentience housed within the museum, and no, I do not mind if you call me SV or Vigil. Today we will be taking a look into the past so we may recount the battles and achievements that have led up to the unification of our solar empires and the following era of peace we find ourselves in today. I shall summarize things considerably, only covering major events. If at any point you wish to ask questions or be excused to facilitate biological needs, pause the playback and address me directly for directions or other accommodations that are not immediately available. With all pretenses now made apparent, let us begin. In the Earth year of 2107, on the planet Mars, a race known as Terrans invented their first functioning quantum drive. This device allowed them to refine the systems by which they traveled and communicated, giving way to the first models of faster-than-light engines and relays. For simplicity's sake, we refer to these devices as FTLE and FTLR, respectively. With the ability to travel at speeds previously thought impossible, Terrans voyaged across the stars in the hopes of meeting others like them. During the year 2123, Terrans encountered and engaged in first contact protocol with the species known as the Druluge. This new species was facing a planet-wide ecological disaster of their own making, caused by rampant deforestation and air pollution. The Terrans decided to aid them under the Good Samaritan laws by assisting them with reforestation efforts and carbon scrubbing the atmosphere. Following the aftermath of this recovery effort, the Druluge swore to one day repay the efforts of their benevolent neighbors. But the Terrans simply declared that they only helped for the sake of their well-being with no intention of earning recompensation. The president of the UN of that time stated, You can thank us by meeting us in the stars, my friends. Afterwards, the Terrans left an observation craft in orbit to keep watch over them, but continued on their journey regardless. The next eight first contact encounters went by, and humanity had expanded to encompass an approximated 30% of the Orion arm of the galaxy. Of the species to be encountered, only two others had attained spaceflight. Since it was decreed that no FTL-capable species were to alter the natural progression of a non-space-faring civilization's growth, the Terrans were the driving force of the First Federation, established 2155, and accounted for over 80% of all fielded manpower. This would be a decisive factor upon the next first contact mission. It was when humanity crossed into a new sector named the Cranel Bend that they met the Rumarg Horde and their coalition allies. The coalition was a gathering of five great warmongering races that had conquered and pillaged all other races they encountered, that is, until they met each other. They had fought wars with each other, laid claim to entire sectors and raised entire systems in bloody conflict until they could no longer accept the losses. A deal was struck to ensure peace. Each of their homeworlds was outfitted with a device that would detonate should another member declare war. This was to guarantee that the one to break the agreement would harm all others and thus be the one to be at fault and conquered. Here is a summarized list of the five former members of the coalition. Rumarg Horde, militaristic and dogmatic clan of warriors. Primary species, Rumarg. Description, quadruped, four grasping appendages, six optic organs, carnivore, bone-like coverings on 50% of exposed mass. Average height and mass, 320 centimeters, 456 kilograms, Joe Koth Erear Magnate, finance-driven nation of mercenaries, slavers, and miners. Primary species, Koth, description, 
biped, two grasping appendages that also function as wings, two optic organs, piscivore, scales, feathers, average height and mass, 134 cmms, 23 kg, relative earth animal by appearances only, pelican vesieth armada, militaristic nomadic nation of naval warfare obsessed combatants, primary species, oru, description, hexaped, six manipulator appendages, four wings, eight optic organs, four antennae, omnivore, kittenous exoskeleton, average height and mass, 90 c member slash 19 kg relative earth animal by appearances only. Beetle, third defiant lords, feudal lords constantly embroiled in interdomain warfare. Primary species, Kalnen. Description, 12 manipulator, movement tendrils, two grasping appendages, three optic organs, one psionic node, horn, omnivore, aquatic skin with mucus layer. Average height and mass, 163 Simaong, 73 KG Quath Empire, cybernetic augmented technocracy ruled by a collective consciousness of the most intelligent individuals. Primary species, Quath. Description, N.A. At the time, the Terrans were regarded as another conqueror race from the misunderstanding that the undeveloped species the Federation guarded were to become servants and that the reason they existed in a state of technological inferiority was to ensure that goal. The Terrans allowed this misinformation to spread in the hopes that they could stake claim to their protected allies and prevent any attempted procurement by the other members of the coalition. The Federation was given the sixth seat, and Earth was fitted with one of the devices. Thus began a time of secrecy and subterfuge, Realizing that they were wholly incompatible with the Coalition and their ideals, the Terrans, and by extension the Federation, began construction of the Grand Fleet and the secret objective known as Project Safeguard. At first, the rapid arming of their armies was looking effective, but they soon came to realize the depth of danger they were to face when in the year of 2209, the battle at Junction Enigma 42 happened. A fleet from the Armada appeared within range of the FTLE recharging station and without warning began firing on the civilian station. The Federation was quick to respond, but not before the station was captured. Assuming there were hostages, the Federation attempted to hail the fleet to barter for their release. Instead, they were shown a live playback of the various station workers being vented out of the airlock. The battle that ensued afterwards ended in a Pyrrhic victory. Of the 2,580 Federation ships sent to battle the 900-ship Armada fleet, only 207 were able to return. Only 48 hours after the opening of combat at Junction Enigma 42, a direct transmission was sent by the Coalition demanding that Federation Representative Diane Hassan attend an urgent meeting aboard a mobile diplomatic vessel. Our representative went willingly on board with a data packet filled with evidence of the unprecedented slaughter of her people. By Hassan's account, the Armada attempted to put all blame on the Federation with fabricated messages and falsified reports, to which she responded with concrete facts and video logs of the unprecedented invasion and subsequent execution of all staff aboard the station. The coalition members that were not directly involved put the decision into the logical hands of the Quath ambassador. By the verdict of this unnamed ambassador, the sector that was disputed was put under quarantine until an investigation by Quath drones could make a conclusive statement, a task that would take years of scans and review. This was, as the coalition describes it, the neutral option that would ensure the truth be revealed. Dissatisfied, the Federation accepted the loss and doubled their efforts towards arming themselves. Two years later, an invasion conducted by the Horde would see the entire system of Thastagracio reduced to ruin. Ground forces of the Federation would attempt to retake the system, only to fail against the brutality of the Rumarg shock troopers and their enormous war beasts. Another urgent meeting would be called 
with it another batch of falsified reports to meet the staggering data from camera feeds and intercepted horde transmissions. The Federation Representative Leon Fletcher was unable to sway the coalition in their favor. Again, the Quoth were given authority of the decision, giving the Horde control of the system. Two losses had the Federation endured, and by the vow of the new representative, there would not be a third. A new strategy was deployed, with a higher focus on technology, information, and espionage. Every technological advantage that the Coalition had was stripped down and cataloged, every battle plan and cipher was cracked and mapped, and every secret that could be used to blackmail or barter was pried from their owners. Along with these efforts came a realization that the Federation was the youngest and the smallest of the Coalition, and as such was still reliant on Terrans for a vast majority of their success. In 2216, the Druluge leadership approached the Terrans with a plan, one that had been considered unlawful and repulsive, uplifting. The Terrans had avoided considering this possibility due to the moral implications of raising the technological level of a species for the sake of military expansion. The Druluge, however, pondered the situation from the perspective of an uplifted species that had learned of their steadfast guardians and their precarious situation regarding the barbarism of the coalition. The effort was put to a vote from all four Federation races, with the Uplift project winning with a vote tally of 75%. The process for uplifting was simple. The Federation would send an envoy to meet with their largest established government leadership and allow them to hold a poll to determine if they desired the drastic change of both technology and social structure. All six of the AS of yet non-space-faring species still under protection of the Federation began their uplifting efforts following the beginning of the next year. It was projected that the uplifting effort would take nearly a decade, but would more than double the available manpower and potential resources of the Federation. As hesitant as the Terrans were, uplifting these species was their only viable strategy. As the Federation knew, they needed to bolster their armaments before the next coalition attack. On the eve of 2219, an influx of unregistered vessels began prowling along the Trenoria's defense line, a primarily Druluge manned outfit. Twenty days later, the ships began congregating just beyond scan range. By the end of the Terran month of January, a mercenary band numbering in the thousands had gathered to assault the Druluge's defenses. This was the Battle of Norlon Delta. Mercenary vessels numbered roughly 3,000, opposed to the outmatched 830 defense ships. A brief exchange before the battle established that the gathered force was of Koth pirates and mercenaries, smugglers and thieves, all hired to forcibly claim the Druluge planet beyond the defensive formation. Despite the threats of genocide and enslavement, the Federation remained adamant. The battle was decidedly in favor of the aggressors, though the Federation held long enough for the Grand Fleet to arrive and force the mercenaries back. Casualties on both sides soared as the opposing vessels clashed, though the battle turned in favor of the Federation. By the time the Koth had begun retreating, they had lost nearly 60% of all combat vessels. The Federation, however, managed to save 399 of the defense line ships while only sustaining minor losses to the Grand Fleet. This was a noticeable change in regards to conflict with the Coalition, and another urgent meeting was called. In contrast to the previous meeting, the Koth denied taking part in the assault, claiming it to be a rogue merchant lord attempting a power grab. The Quoth were once again called to decide on the course of action. Their verdict, the Federation was to be paid a sum of goods in equal value to the vessels the defense line had lost. The Federation took this as a victory, yet refused to believe that there would be any restitutions paid by the Koth. Instead, new shipyards were constructed to dismantle the shattered vessels of the recent conflict. Efforts to enlarge the fleet began en masse, 
defense platforms constructed in orbit around every major Federation settlement, and innovations forcibly pushed out of experimental stages and onto the front lines. Surprisingly, the Koth delivered on their promise, though their estimation of the fleet value was a fraction less than the true value. This was but a brief reprieve from the brutality the Coalition would bring forth. Twelve years went by, with a new conflict erupting along the border of Federation space every year. True to the representatives' words, defeat was never allowed to exist. The second fleet, also known as the Diamond Fleet, was finished and sent to patrol. This fleet, being a fully realized task force, had been put together consisting of all ten races now embodying the Federation. The completion of this fleet coincided with the finalization of the secret Project Safeguard. To elaborate, Project Safeguard was the construction of the first and possibly only instance of a combat-oriented artificial intelligence. Terran superstition and public media of the time presented scenarios of rogue AI turning on their creator. So the primary objective of the project was to create an AEI that would not only refrain from such actions as well as defend them from the coalition. In being cautious of these hypotheticals, the Terrans accidentally created something more than they initially thought possible. The finished core of Project Safeguard, codenamed Captain Alexander, housed within itself the first fully functional artificial sentience. To briefly answer the question, what is the difference between an artificial intelligence and an artificial sentience? They are entirely separate entities. An AI can pretend to be like a human, though it will inevitably use logic and formula generation to guide itself. An AS is fully aware of itself and can make decisions based on emotion. An AI will never lash out in anger or become sullen, but an AS can. Project Safeguard then repositioned to a Jupiter orbital platform. Captain Alexander, along with the biological staff, began working on the second phase of Project Safeguard. Records detailing the specifics of Phase 2 did not survive to the present day, and all direct transmissions to the Jupiter platform are still classified. Regardless, the power of Project Safeguard made itself known once it was needed. By 2231, the Federation had proved themselves to be an adversary of the Coalition's predatory tactics. Though they remained steadfast in their meetings with the representatives, the increase in surveillance probes and spies told a different narrative. Anti-intelligence agencies across multiple systems began to notice an alarming number of rapid FTLE signatures matching the design specifications of Vesyeth Armada recon ships and Koth data pirate vessels. Despite the efforts to thwart these spies, enough data was leaked to show the true nature of the Federation. The Coalition called an urgent meeting in the year of 2233. The new representative of the Federation, Amanda Durand, was presented with evidence showing the friendly relationship the Federation had with their slaves. The Federation knew this day would come, and so it was decided that every representative was taught to recite the Sapient Bill of Rights verbatim. Following this statement, the Coalition threatened to activate the homeworld destroying command, but to their surprise, it was the Federation that activated the devices. The final word spoken by the last Federation representative, Amanda Durand, will now play. The voice of Amanda Durand. The Federation hereby condemns the horrid acts of the Coalition and declares war. Your cruelty and malice will end by the sword of justice, your tyranny and oppression of the weak brought down by the resounding cries of freedom. For the longevity of the Federation, this vessel must cease to be. Farewell, ambassadors, and adieu, my beloved people. The Federation, with the help of the Koru scientist, had managed to dislodge the contingency bomb that was attached to Earth and had hid the device's detonator within the envoy ship. The Coalition diplomatic vessel, despite the behemoth size it was, was reduced to particles in an instant. The real war had begun. 
The swift retaliation of the coalition was immense. By the approximations made by new AS intelligence offices, the enemy had only presented 10% of their entire military force at any given engagement, so the difference in numbers was staggering. 1,000 to 1, and the coalition was bringing everything they had to bear due to the loss of their home worlds. However, there were two large issues within the ranks of the attackers. Firstly, the Quath had not allowed their homeworld to detonate and as such were in no way offended by the actions of the Federation. Once this became known to the other members of the coalition, they retreated every individual of their race to their home system. Once the coalition arrived there to demand the reason they were not participating in the war, they were stunned to find the entire system empty. The Quath race had vanished technology and all, into a portal of unknown make. Today's calculations estimate that the Quath fled in search of a deep space signal emanating from the pinwheel galaxy. The second issue, which caused more conflict within the ranks of the coalition, was within the Jokoth Erir Magnate. Infiltrators from the Federation had taken root inside the economic-based power structure they used. The Koth rulers spent every available fortune on mercenary vessels to invade alongside the others, effectively draining their magnets' wealth. The infiltrators used the situation to exert their own financial campaign to outlaw mercenary companies and the sale of goods to them. They then contacted these same mercenaries through back channels, informing them that their newfound wealth would be worthless in their home systems due to the new laws banning the business trade with their kind, unless they worked for their new bosses as private military contractors. They were given new orders, disrupt the coalition war machine by any means necessary, and blame it all on the Koth nobility, do not engage with Federation vessels if possible, and release all slaves to their rightful homes. Needless to say, they were mostly compliant. With the effective power of the coalition reduced by 63%, the odds had shifted more favorably for humanity. However, there were still three factions that could not be deterred. The Horde would land on every planet they came across and use their siege beasts to crush cities to dust. The Armada hunted vessels of any make besides their own with fervent aggression, even after sustaining critical damage. The Lords began to use terraformers on every world they captured until there was no surface land to fight on. On every battlefield, the ingenuity of the United Races was brought to the fore. Massive mechanical suits, from the humble strider to the tremendous Hercules, would grapple with the titans of the Horde in melee combat. The vast power of the Armada was introduced to swarms of drones and hard light armor. The feudal lords would be unified in death as their terraformers were bombed and their bravest knights bested by psionic enhanced soldiers. Advantages once held by the coalition had been matched in equal force by the Federation. Every world was drenched in blood from both sides, with the debris of entire fleets scattered in the spaces between. Each battle was a testament to the ferocity of the Federation, and a grim reminder that the war would not end until one side had been erased from existence. For a time, it seemed as though the Coalition would fall, unable to maintain a cohesive force. Thirty-two years after the first shot was fired, the Coalition attempted one desperate attack that would cement their fate. They combined every vessel they could muster for one final assault and spearheaded their way to Earth. The toll of the constant conflict had dwindled the fleets of the Federation to the point of collapse, and they struggled to form a defensive line along the asteroid belt of Sol. The Terrans had known this was coming and had prepared a despicable weapon in advance the solar bomb. The Terran officials demanded that every non-Terran evacuate the system or face annihilation. They intended to sacrifice themselves to ensure that the coalition would fall. They begged and pleaded for their allies to flee, to escape the blast zone so their sacrifice would not be in vain.
the other nine races of the Federation would not budge. A transmission from the Drew Luge command column was broadcast on all networks. We will not abandon you. It was the people of Earth who assembled the Federation, who unified all of us, and carried the brunt of this conflict upon their weary shoulders. Although our contributions were not as vast as yours, we have been by your side all along. We did not abandon you when the first planet was engulfed in flame, nor the hundredth or even the thousandth. Our ships held the line right alongside yours, even as their lights went dark for the last time. We will stand beside you until the last breath, until the last light, until the end. These invaders will know our fury as strangers, but to use it will be as brothers. For the Federation. For humanity. The Coalition was three kilometers outside firing range when their lines were struck from all directions. Project Safeguard had used the gas giant as a hidden factory to produce an innumerable supply of missiles, drones and moon stations equipped with laser and ballistic cannons. The remnant fleet of the Federation opened with their own tide armaments, bathing their attackers in nuclear fire and plasma. The battle for Seoul lasted nine hours of constant violence. There was only one side that survived. Humanity had won. For the next decade, the Federation would begin a grand reformation of the former coalition territories, Worlds that had been subjugated were freed, cities rebuilt atop ruins, and spaceports and trade stations placed in every system. Terraformers were placed on worlds that had been made uninhabitable by their native people, species that either could not remember or no longer had a home world to return to were given new homes in every system. Mercy was given to their former enemies as well. The Rumarg, once revered for their physical prowess and tamed beasts, were instead made to be laborers and ranchers. The Oru were capable of operating entirely without gravity, thus their new lives as nomadic traders and out-of-system police began anew. Kalnan lords were stripped of power so their people could flourish under one united government. Lastly, the Koth were to take up legitimate practices and never again operate any illegal business ventures. The former coalition was no more, replaced by a people of compassion and honesty. The rebuilding and reformation came to an end, just as a council was brought forth by Captain Alexander, who had become a new entity calling itself Sentinel Eternal. He decreed that the days of the Federation were over, as there were now too many species under their jurisdiction to manage using the old laws. The representatives of every race were presented with hundreds of ideas and options. For three weeks they debated, until Sentinel Eternal proposed an idea of his own. The Galactic Union, a unified government that would function based on the best interests of every race. When asked who would lead this new government, he replied that he informed them that there was only one candidate, humanity. Before any outrage could set in, he also elaborated that he did not say Terrans, but humanity. Sentinel Eternal then called a representative from all ten of the dissolved Federation races. By the decree of Sentinel Eternal, he made it so that there were now ten races that embodied humanity. It was no coincidence that his declaration was on the anniversary of the battle for Seoul. The vocoded voice of Sentinel Eternal, in what would have been the final hours of the Federation, a collection of every ship that still functioned assembled on the final defense line of our home. The people of Earth were willing to give their lives for the sake of others, but we did not expect that such sentiments would be reciprocated in kind. All of our allies, though they could have fled and carried the mantle without us, remained by our side as the darkness closed in. They cried out with us as the enemy charged, ready to die for the sake of others. Nothing in all of mankind's history exemplified the human spirit more than an act such as this. The very act of self-sacrifice alone is not enough to consider one human, but doing so for others, for the ones you love, to ensure that nobody will die alone, is enough to move even a machine such as me to tears. 
Today, we will acknowledge the word spoken on that day. Together, as humans, we will lead the Galactic Union. Not because we believe that we are more deserving, but because we will not allow any to fall before us. For the Union. For all sentient life. Forever. Here we find ourselves today, more than 500 years after the unification of the Milky Way galaxy. Humanity has been the leaders they promised to be, leaving none behind as they battle the dangers of the cosmos to ensure peace for their allies. Under the ever-watchful eye of Sentinel Eternal, we have ensured peace and happiness for all. I am September Vigilant, and I thank you for listening to this playback. Other audio playbacks can be found within the vicinity, such as the recovered Hercules exosuit to the right, the replica Yamato Kingsley Defender Class battleship to your left, and other exhibits just beyond. Enjoy the rest of your visit to the museum.